So welcome everyone. Today uh, we are from Fairwinds and today we're going to talk about how to deploy in CICD uh, as part of building a Kubernetes platform. So um, I am Stevie Caldwell and I am a tech lead here at Fairwinds. I've been here for a few years now, um, a long history of working my way up from uh, desktop support uh, to sysadmin, to network engineer, to DevOps, to uh, here at Fairwinds, um, where I primarily work um, in Kubernetes and uh, you know help support our open source projects. And I'll hand it over to Andy to talk about himself a little bit. All right, I'm Andy, I'm the CTO here. I'm also a reformed sysadmin, as I like to say. <clears throat> um, I've been doing Kubernetes for, I think I'm up to six years at this point, and I've been with this company for five now. Uh, and I'm an author and maintainer of a bunch of our open source and just love talking all things Kubernetes and and these days platform, because that's the new, the new hot word. It is. All right. So um, a little bit about Fairwinds. I'm going to read off from this lovely, uh, this uh, lovely slide and put on my radio voice. Fairwinds provides software for platform engineers running Kubernetes to standardize and enable development best practices. Standardize, automate, and enforce Kubernetes best practices to ship applications faster. How's that? All right. Yep. <laughs> like Andy said, platform is like the new hotness. Um, and I'm not going to read this, this slide off to you because I trust um, that you can handle this on your own. Um, but, um, so, um, platform is essentially like a way for, uh, allowing devs to deploy their artifacts quickly, uh, without having to pay too much attention to like the underlying infrastructure and it abstracts a lot of that stuff away. Um, but also abstracts it in a way that it's still like safe and sane with some safe and sane, like defaults and things like that. Um, there's a internal development platform is like the the uh, sort of acronym or one of the terms that we use to talk about platforms. I think that is a little confusing because IDP stands for a lot of things in my world, right? Like it's, identity it's provider, identity provider, intrusion detection, um, uh, intrusion detection and prevention. Um, so uh, I think we need to come up with some more acronyms, but. Uh, that's essentially what it is. And I read something that uh, said that uh, a good internal developer platform should abstract away infrastructure decisions, enable self-service environment builds, integrate with existing continuous uh, delivery and uh, integration and deployment processes and assign role-based access controls. Um, so it's essentially like a self-service layer for devs, but providing some like good guardrails and security features so that um, nothing breaks, hopefully, right? So um, when we talk about a Kubernetes platform, uh, we're sort of, we approach it as four different uh, areas, right? That's a uh, next slide, my friend. I ah, think. sorry. I'm moving on so fast. There we go. All right, next so slide. We're, we're talking about like four components when we talk about like a platform in the Kubernetes world. Um, we talk about add-ons. So those are like the default tools that your platform engineers or you know DevOps folks or you know whatever you want to call uh, that side, um, the sort of default things that you want to install in your clusters, right? So this is how you want to handle DNS, how you want to handle certificates, how you want to handle exposing your workloads uh, to external um, external clients or or sources. Um, and we talked about that. We do have like a video where we talked about that, um, installing add-ons with GitOps. Uh, and then we talk about, and then the other uh, portion, a component of a Kubernetes platform is governance, right? And that is how you essentially uh, secure your platform, uh, secure your environment and um, try and prevent bad things from happening, right? So that could be, um, how you enforce uh, or what you want enforced for uh, resource requests and limits on workloads that uh, get submitted to your clusters um, and capabilities, Linux capabilities that you want um, to either enforce or prevent on workloads, uh, labels, namespaces that people can deploy to, all sorts of things that falls into that whole governance um, category or component. 
And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the deployment component, right? So um, these other two sort of focus more on like, I think the DevOps platform engineer side of things. And today we're gonna kind of look at things from like the, the dev uh, side of things, like what's it look like to deploy uh, into an environment that has these other things going on for it, right? And so Andy has uh, set up a wonderful demo for us. Uh, he's gonna walk us through that. But uh, before we do that, I did need to ask Andy an important question. Uh, <laughs> the question is, do you know why the mobile phone was wearing glasses? I do not. It lost its contacts. <laughs> so, nice. That's a good one. A, that was a good one. That's All right. Good one. So All right. with that, I'm handing it over to Andy to uh, drive us through this demo. All right. Let's see if I can find the right screen this time. Oh, don't answer that polling question yet. That's later. All right. So. I'm gonna spend a little, a decent amount of time talking about sort of the whole setup here because there's a lot of things going on. Um, and so what I've done here is I have essentially built what I would see as, you know, sort of a, a good starting point for a platform. It's got a decent amount of policy in place. It's got add-ons, it's got some self-service stuff. And so I'm going to talk about how we've tied all these concepts that we've talked about in the past with, you know, deploying add-ons with GitOps and adding policy and enforcing policy and pull request reviews and all of that stuff and try and tie it all together into, you know, as Stevie said, I'm a developer and I need to deploy an application. <clears throat> so I have actually removed a lot of my own permissions from this cluster uh, because typically I would be the admin of the cluster. Um, and I and I've built a Kubernetes cluster. So we have we have a Kubernetes cluster, but how do I get to it? Uh, how do I access this cluster? What's going on here? What am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to do? Um, and so we have here uh, sort of uh, an example setup of how you might set this up. So I have we have Vault internally at Fairwinds, uh, and Vault has the ability to generate to hand out AWS credentials. And because this is an EKS cluster, we can associate those AWS credentials with specific groups or roles in the cluster. Uh, and so I have run uh, a command that we have. So like you might have like a lightweight CLI utility or like a bash uh, script that you hand out to folks that basically goes out to vault and it gets some credentials and it puts them in my environment. So I'm gonna do that. Um, and we see here that I have um, an AWS identity right now that is associated with this uh, this assumed role team one. Uh, I just gave it a, a name as if I was on a specific dev team or however you wanted to break it up. So now if you know my developers know a little bit about Kubernetes, if they know how to do a kubectl command, we could do you know things like kubectl get nodes or wait. No, I can't because I'm not allowed to do that. Um, but we could do a kubectl get pods um, and start to see what's running in this cluster. Um, but the beauty here is I've given access to the cluster to my developer. But if they wanted to do something like delete the nginx, NGINX ingress namespace, we're gonna stop them from doing that. So the first tool that is involved in this platform here is called RBAC Manager. RBAC Manager is a Fairwinds open source tool that makes building RBAC bindings easier. So if we take a look at our RBAC Manager RBAC definition, uh, which is the CRD associated with RBAC Manager, we'll see here that we have this RBAC binding for team one, it's associated with the group team one, um, that's configured by the fact that we're coming in as the role um, from AWS that of team one. Uh, and we see we have the cluster role binding view. Now you might think, oh, we don't wanna be able to view certain things, just some things in the cluster. And luckily the built-in role view is very smart about that. We can't get secrets across the entire cluster. That would be probably a bad thing. Um, so we, uh, we can't get secrets. We're really limited to just being able to see what's going on in the cluster. And I think that's valuable for folks, for developers who wanna know what's available in the cluster, what's going on there, um, but they don't necessarily have to do that. 
And then the next really cool thing that I really like about RBAC Manager is that it can do dynamic role bindings. And what that means is that we can, as administrators, create namespaces that then get RBAC bindings associated with them automatically as soon as they're created and labeled. So we have here the role binding on the cluster role edit that is bound to the namespace selector, which you can't actually do in Kubernetes. This is what RBAC manager does for you. Any namespace that matches the label team one admin will give the cluster role edit to uh, that team one group. So if we look here, yeah, did you have a question? I had a quick question. So is this uh, a dynamic? Well, you might be getting to this. So is this a dynamic thing where if I create a, so any, even after I've applied this to the cluster, any new namespace that I create will fall under this rule as well? Yes. Okay. Um, and my second question, and my immediate thought was, what happens if I just label a namespace uh, with that with that label, team one admin? Great question. So because of my already existing very limited permissions, I can't say label the cube system namespace um, team one equals admin because I don't have permission to patch namespaces anywhere. I don't have any edit permissions anywhere. Uh, and nor can I create namespaces. If I wanted to try to create a namespace team two, I can't do that either. So there's no available privilege escalation here. Very good question. Um, Obviously, we have to be careful about that when doing RBAC, right? We don't want privilege escalation just built into the system. Uh, so as an administrator, so in the bottom half of the screen, I'm an administrator. In the top half of the screen, I'm a developer. Um, so if as an administrator, if I create the namespace team1a and I label that namespace team1a, team1 equals admin, I can do an RBAC lookup on team one. RBAC lookup is another Fairwinds open source tool um, that lets me see that uh, team one has edit permissions in this, in this uh, namespace team one A because I just created that label. Um, so it is definitely dynamic. It happens on the fly. So as an administrator, we can manage those namespaces however we want. Uh, we can do it manually, we can do it with another tool, we can do it with GitOps, like however we want to manage the namespaces. But now we don't have to manage RBAC definition, RBAC bindings for every single namespace we create. So it's very easy to just say, hey, developer needs a namespace, boom, here you go. You could even build a self-service way to do that if you wanted to um, with approvals or however you wanted to do it. So um, I'm going to just double check team one equals new. We're going to relabel the namespace and let's do our RBAC lookup. And all of a sudden, our edit permissions in the team 1A namespace are gone, even though the team 1A namespace still exists. So, first thing about giving developers access is giving them the right amount of access so that they can do what they need to do, but not allowing them to do just, you know, anything as in delete your ingress controller because that might make a headache for you know the other developers working in this cluster. Uh, so we have edit permissions here uh, in the team one namespace. My context is currently set to the team one namespace. And we see we can get the uh, secrets in this namespace. I can delete secrets in this namespace if I want, which I actually want to. Um, and um, do whatever we need to within this namespace. So that's the RBAC that's involved here. Uh, and then the next thing that we'll talk about is add-ons. And I think, you know, Kubernetes gives you that base layer API, but now we need to do stuff on top of it. Stevie alluded to this, which is like, uh, we need to be able to get traffic into the cluster. We probably have apps that we want to expose to the world. We probably need certificates. We probably need DNS. Maybe we need auto scaling. Maybe we need, uh, you know, that's built into Kubernetes, but we could do some better auto scaling. Um, we need to be able to get, you know, new nodes provisioned as we add workloads into this cluster. And so that comes into where we have, where, where we install all the add ons in the cluster. So if we go back to the screen, we have running in this cluster uh, Argo CD, which is a GitOps tool, and it is managing a whole slew of add ons. So 
we have multiple projects within our Argo CD configuration. And so if we look at the infrastructure project, we see that um, we, we have, again, all these add-ons, we've got Ingress Nginx, we've got external DNS, we've got the CSI driver, because we need that. We need a load balancer controller. So if people need you know TCP-based services, they can do that instead of having to go through an Ingress. Um, and Argo CD itself here, obviously. Uh, and so you may be wondering at me as a developer, like, why can I see all this? Why is this here um, for me to view? And why is there this delete button? Like, didn't you just say, I can't go delete Ingress Nginx? Um, and the answer to that question is no, I cannot. Because we have Argo CD set to allow anybody to view the infrastructure, but not to delete it or modify it. I think this is valuable because sometimes like you're using an ingress nginx object and perhaps um, you uh, you know you're not sure if a request is making it through the ingress controller to your pod and you need to debug that. So now I can as a developer actually go view the logs for the uh, ingress controller. That's actually a problem. I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, <laughs> but live we, demo <laughs> live demos for sure um so we've given all of the necessary access for them to do that and then you know again you may be wondering about secrets here um lovely thing about argo cd is if we have secrets and we go look at the live manifest we're obfuscating those so um giving the ability to view what's going on in cluster i think is super valuable um do they have that to look is, at it no yeah that is that is because uh, one of the things that I always remember hearing that, you know, devs rightfully complain about is when something goes wrong, not being able to even begin to like troubleshoot it themselves because you have something so locked down that they don't have access to even, you know, try, right? So like we would complain on the one hand, like, oh, we have to like, you know, troubleshoot this thing, but like we don't give devs the tools to try to do this for themselves. So this is super, super important, I think. Um, yeah. Definitely. Totally agree. Totally agree. You know, and if like the Ingress controller is just totally down, developer can go see that and be like, right. hey, is this what's causing my problem? Instead of, hey, my stuff's broken and I have no idea why. Exactly. So yeah, empowering and enabling rather than restricting. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about deploying. So I'm, I'm a member of team one. I have this app. It needs to go into this cluster. Well, how do I how do I do that? How do I get in here? So um, we're just gonna create a new app. Um, you know, ideally we will have documented this process and handed it out to people. And I'm following a document, but since I made the process, I'm just gonna follow it. Um, so I'm gonna call this Andy's awesome demo, and I'm a member of Team One. So let's put it in the Team One project. And let's see what this uh, self-heal prune thing is all about. So Argo is supposed to like make everything better. So let's try that out. And uh, I'm not, I don't even know what all this stuff is. So I'm going to ignore it. And then um, I have, we have this set up here. So we've already populated the Argo setup with credentials for any of the Fairwinds ops, uh, GitHub org uh, repositories. There's a bunch of different ways to do this with Argo, but basically just Providing access to like these code repos automatically, super valuable. Um, I actually have this in a different org, my personal org for various reasons, but um, we're just gonna hook it up to that GitHub repo. And, and this, go ahead. Just really quick, this is part of what like the platform team would set up for you, right? They would set up the, the GitHub, they would uh, set up the GitHub repository stuff and the credentials to allow Argo to talk to the repositories that you need, right? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, if we go look at um, the Argo CD configuration, we can see here the um, repo, Fairwinds infrastructure repo is added here. So Argo does this via secrets that have specific annotations on them. Um, so that are specific labels. So this is a repository secret. Um, and then we've pre-populated the credentials and it's actually split between two different objects. Um, so you could, in theory, I believe here, when I go to add a new app, I could say, you know, Fairwinds Ops demos, and it would go ahead and add that repository for me since we already have the temp, it's called like a 
repo template in Argo CD that's been deployed with the credentials. Um, so yeah, definitely something that, you know, you have to configure ahead of time to make it a little bit easier so that, you know, you don't have developers trying to create access tokens that then right. have access and all that good stuff. So, yeah. um, so. And you're doing this app, you're, you're creating this application, which is a specific type of object in Argo CD in the UI. Um, but you could also set it up so that your developers can create applications using YAML and that whole thing. Right? Yeah, definitely. And actually I was thinking about it. You could totally, you could definitely do both. And then you could also even let teams build their own app of apps for Argo CD. So like mm -hmm. I can do this one manually that points to my Argo repo that is just a list of other applications that it mm -hmm. then just goes and like adds more apps. So the team could manage that however they wanted to. I think that's, you know, part of the self-service ethos here is like you have options, you know, you can do a much more code-based option. You could do it this way. Mm -hmm. It's still... You know, yeah, the application manifest here won't be a, you know, a, as code um, necessarily, which is not ideal, but it is still an object in the Kubernetes. We could, you know, right. save that out as code if we wanted or whatever. So, yep. okay. um, yeah, yeah, I've thought about that a lot, actually, because the, there's a lot of different ways you can deploy with Argo CD. There's right. dozens, right? Yeah. Um, so in my demos repo here, uh, we have um a demo app uh and it's got some objects in it so i'm just going to point it at that directory uh and then we only have access to one cluster that's in this list you know if there were multiple clusters if we were doing more of a push model there might be more clusters involved here um we already know from our rbac demonstration that we only have access to the team one namespace so let's just focus on that and then we will do nothing else and so we just hit create here and we can filter the projects down to just our project. And we'll see, we've already created Andy's awesome demo here and we're, we're deploying objects. Um, that's great. It's starting to sync because I hit the sync, uh, auto sync button. Um, and, oh, we have a failure. What's going on here? Admission webhook insights.fairwinds.com denied the request. Privilege escalation should not be allowed. CPU limit should not be more than 20% higher than the request. And it should not be running as privilege. Oh. This is a terrible like, workload, Andy. This is what have so I done? Bad. What have I done? What have I done? So this is where we get into the policy and um guardrails portion of this. So, you know, we've given team one the ability to create pretty much whatever they want in their namespace. We've kept them from deleting everything outside of that namespace and, and getting into secrets and things like that they don't necessarily want to have access to. But now there's like a thousand ways to deploy something to Kubernetes wrong, <laughs> right? Let's forgive my terrible English there, but like there's a lot of ways to configure your deployments wrong uh, improperly. And so um, if we take a look at my, um, at uh, the demo app, actually, let's just go into the directory, make this a little bit bigger. And we take a look at this deployment, you know, I could have just said, a, a put into really basic deployment, right? And just like left out a whole bunch of this other stuff um, and just not had a security context. And it turns out this would be the case. Privileged escalation would be allowed. We would be running as root. We would be doing all of these things that we strongly recommend you don't do, but are really easy to do because they're the defaults in Kubernetes. And so we have a whole series of policies applied to this cluster that uh, prevent you from doing that. So if we go back to our message here, we'll see uh, the first one is that privilege escalation should not be allowed. So let's go ahead and fix that. Um, and then we can't be running as privileged. That's probably the most egregious one in this in here. Running a privileged pod is like just, you know, keys to the kingdom here. Um, and so it said my CPU limit should not be more than 20% higher than my request. Uh, so I'm going to change this to be just the same as my request. Um, but also, you know, I, this thing needs more memory. So let, let's just, let's just bump that up. Um, and I think that was all of the issues. So I'm just going to get those all committed. 
um, fix my issues. Um, I don't know if we have enough time for that today, but um, I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just push. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so we'll just push this up, and uh, I'm gonna be impatient and tell it to hard refresh. Uh, and let's see if we can get this get get our deployment out there. And at this point, like, especially if we have these policies documented somewhere, I as a developer, I haven't even even had to talk to an infrastructure engineer to try to deploy my app, right? Not a word. All I have is like one doc that's like, here's the basic steps. And then I've got some decent error messages that said, hey, you can't do this, uh, this thing. And, um, oh, right. Um, and so that that's the process. Sorry, I have to terminate the previous sync because it failed. And then we'll do a new sync after we refresh. Oh, we've got another, we got another error. Oh, my memory limit. I can't set that 20% higher. Goodness, y'all are restrictive here. But this is when the devs start shaking their fist and pounding the, the desk in front of them, like the platform team. Jeez, so many <laughs> restrictions. Uh, all right. So, you know, it would have been really nice if I didn't have to wait till it's deployed to find out about this problem. Don't you think? Yeah, I do. I mean, because this whole going back and forth and redeploying and redeploying is 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 annoying, right? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of uh, effort and there's a lot of extra time. It'd be great if you could catch this farther left. Agreed. Agreed. Um, so let's uh, let's make a pull request for our new change because you know we've gotten past the POC stage. We really need to start making pull requests on this app. We can't just be yeeting everything into uh into main like we have been um and let's go take a look at our pull request all right oh we have a required check here fairwinds insights hey that's that thing that was blocking me earlier what's that do? what is uh what is this what is this fairwinds insights thing oh look at this okay I fixed some action items. So deployment, demo, basic demo, great name, Andy. Uh, memory limit should not be more than that. That's that error I had earlier. That is. Uh, yeah, and okay. it's been fixed. So great, I got the feedback here. It says it's all good to go. Hopefully if I merge this, we're good. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, I'm acting a little bit here, a little, <laughs> little uh, tongue in cheek. So um, the first time you did it, I was actually like, wait, what happened? What went wrong? And you were really convincing. So. <laughs> Pat yourself on the back. Yeah, I mean, that happens a lot in my demos, so it's, it's totally fair. Uh, <laughs> so this um, this is all being done with Fairwinds Insights. So Fairwinds Insights is the, the engine that's powering all of these guardrails and all of this uh, automation behind the, um, behind the platform here. So Argo CD plus Insights and the other open source tools I talked about. So if we go look at our cluster and we go look at the admission controller, we can actually see our previous failed deployments here. So we see here the failed deployment, demo, basic demo in namespace team one. And we look here, memory limit should not be more than 20% higher than the request. If we look at this one, um, it looks like we did that one twice. Argo is probably retrying, but uh, in general, we can, we can see the reasons that we were uh, failing here. And if we go back to our PR, we'll actually see there's a link to view this report uh, in Insights. Um, and that goes to all, over to our repositories tab. And if we look at the Suderman Jr. demos repo, um, we can ignore that one. I haven't figured out how to make that go away yet. But um, we can take a look at our branch, which is fixed memory. Uh, and we can see here this was fixed, which is the exact report we got in our PR, which I didn't have to go log into Insights. It's just going to do all this for me. As an administrator, I have all of this configured. So if we go take a look at our policy and we look at our OPA policies, you can see these policies define saying, you know, the various things that, that I've tried to do here, which is like the memory limit being too high, the CPU limit being too high. Um, if I had tried to create a host path mount, that would be blocked. But then we also have a whole bunch of built-in stuff. So those ones I wrote myself, um, but we have the Polaris ones as well. So for example, if I had tried to just, well, actually, let's just do it. 
Um, let's just say, you know what? I'm tired of dealing with this 20% resources thing. Like, let's just delete the resources block because um, and that why? Would <laughs> that I would totally do that happen. as a developer. Yeah. yeah, I'd be like, this is, <laughs> I mean, I am tired of this. How do I uh, get around this? I'm just going to delete it. Um, yep. All right, so we'll push that up into our PR and, oh, I already merged that. Um, that's okay. I'm just making stuff up here as we go. Let's go look at this new PR. Andy's PR names actually also very much uh, will sometimes look like that. Like <laughs> some random all caps like R. <laughs> depending on how many times he's uh, iterated on an issue. We've all had the chain of commits that just get increasingly more aggressive as we try to fix a problem that's particularly frustrating. So, um, but now we have four new action items that we've created with this PR saying that, hey, you can't remove the CPU and memory requests because like, that's a problem in a cluster. <laughs> This is about um, the time the dev throws the computer out the window, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we've been, we've documented all of this. We've given guidelines up front. We've provided templates that suggest how to set them right. and things like that. So ideally, this is not, you know, just coming at it cold and having to go through this process, but we're showing how you can sort of put these guardrails in place. <laughs> um, all right. So if we go back to our demo app, Look at that, everything is deployed. We could see we've got um, a scaled object here. That's a Kita thing. Um, and actually we'll talk about that a little bit because now I've got, you know, I've got my app deployed. That's great. Hopefully, you know, we have this ingress. It probably has some sort of host name. Um, so we can go to our demo, see it working, hooray. Um, looks like, do I only have, why do I not, oh, ah, there it is. Why do we only have one pod? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, maybe there's something wrong with our uh, scaled object. We can take a look at that in a second. So we have our app deployed, that's great. Um, and we can go into insights and we can see uh, any particular action items that might be specific to our cluster here. So we can, uh, take a look at the sandbox cluster and we can filter down like if we're really curious what the other stuff that wasn't blocked that we were just allowed to do uh, we can take a look at that not a lot going on here but um, some small issues but then we can also um, you know if we're not certain that our resource requests and limits were quite right so we can go over to the sufficiency tab and we can take a look at the team one namespace, which may not have any data in it because I literally just created the apps in here, but we can take a look at, you know, an example workload here over time, and it'll show us what it thinks our request and limits should be. So if, you know, my boss comes to me and says, hey, you know, you always spending too much money with this app. I can come in here very quickly and easily see the suggestions for that. Um, there's things in the costs tab as well related to that. I'm not going to go into it too deeply, but it's all available um, here. Um, so let's, let's take a look. How much time do we have? We've got a few minutes. Um, let's try and figure out what's going on with our scaled object. Oh, we have two pods now. That's a good sign. And so Kita is, uh, another open source project, not a Fairwinds project, just an external, another project. I don't remember who works on that. Um, but it, uh, it manages your horizontal pod autoscalers for you. And I really like this as a tool for, um, for operators to put in the cluster for folks to use because it's much simpler to use lots of different metric sources for your horizontal pod autoscalers th than just raw HPA is. Um, so if we take a look at this scaled object, this is fairly simple. This is, you know, I'm targeting that deployment. I've got a min replica count of two. I've got a max of 20. But the cool thing here is this trigger. So normally when you first create your first HPA, you're going to do it on CPU. You're going to say, I'm using, I want to use this much CPU, target of 80%. 
scale up and down. And that's sort of really, you know, for most applications, just a proxy for performance. It's not really a great metric to scale on because there's no, like the end user of your application or product isn't going to experience high CPU as a negative effect or a positive effect, right? They might um, see latency uh, at the as an end user, right? Like high latency may be a reason to scale up. So anyway, and if you're yeah. if you're running a web deployment or if you're running like a web uh, service of some kind, like even a little latency is enough to you know quickly have a user quickly just click off of your off of your web page. Like people yes. don't want to wait for that stuff. So this is certainly uh, what you're about to talk about is certainly a better measurement um, for how to how to scale up. Sorry. No, you're good. I totally agree. And that's a, a great point. Like web services, if it's more than, you know, a few hundred milliseconds, I am out. Like, nope. <laughs> so uh, we're impatient human beings for sure. Uh, so what this allows us to do is we've installed Prometheus as one of the add-ons in the cluster. Um, and we can scale on Prometheus queries just right out of the box. There's no extra deployment or anything like that. So I, as an end user, knowing this from the documentation that I was so graciously provided by my ops engineer, know that if I go to Prometheus in our sandbox here, I can actually make queries. Um, so I'm, I'm worried about my demo, basic demo, um, probably some sort of requests uh, so Nginx Ingress controller requests, what do we have here? It's a whole bunch of stuff, but we can say we are looking for the exported service. I'm really enjoying you uh, putting together uh, a Prometheus query in real time. <laughs> that is always fun. <laughs> right. Although the, the new versions of Prometheus make this way easier. Um, so now we have... Let's do um, a rate on that. All right, so now we have a rate across all three ingress controllers. We'll just sum that up. And look at that, now we have a request uh, for every five minutes. We can bump that down to one if we want. Um, let's do five, we'll make it a little less responsive. Uh, and we see here, you know, we, we can look at the graph of that. It's been going up because I opened this and it actually, it starts pinging uh, once you open it. So if anybody wants to just hammer at uh, demo.sandbox.hillghost.com, feel free. Uh, maybe I'll actually uh, do that. Demo.sandbox.hillghost.com. There's a ping endpoint. Let's just fire it up. Um, so we can increase our latent our uh, request rate here. Uh, I believe there are latency metrics available. I'm not certain. That's not super important. But we see here Nginx Singers controller requests host. Um, I put exported service. Either one works. Um, and I want it to be about 20 requests per pod. Um, and so what Kita does is in our Team One namespace, it goes ahead and creates an HPA and then also serves the metric up to that HPA. So you don't have to deal with custom metrics providers and all these things. And Kita has a whole bunch of different plugins. So it's a great tool for a platform to give your developers the ability to scale better and more intelligently. So ideally we look here and hey, we've already scaled up. We're up to three pods um, and everything is green. So, um, yeah. Oh, there we go. Now we're taking off. Got a few more pods. Let's run our. Oh, I opened Prometheus twice. I did. Gotta love that curve. I may have hit it a little too hard. Um, so, yeah. So, we've gone from zero to deploying an application with Ingress. Uh, you may also have may also have noticed that this demo endpoint is HTTPS and I am getting a valid cert and it already created the DNS for me on the fly. So I could I could rename that DNS name if I wanted and redeploy it and I'd get the same thing. 
uh, because we have external DNS and cert manager running. I, as a developer, didn't need to know that. All I needed was the documentation to tell me that this is what my ingress object should look like. Uh, this annotation to get a cert and uh, this information to get a cert and then set your host name. And there you go. So some, you know, I could probably write a two page doc on how to use the platform and you'd be able to onboard apps into this platform. Now, obviously we're missing some capabilities. We don't have databases yet. We don't have, uh, you know, unless you wanted to run it in Kubernetes, we don't have, uh, I don't know, maybe you need a queue or something like that, but you know, there's things that we can layer on top of this, but this is a great starting point, a great way to enable people to deploy, so. That's awesome. That's a uh, A to Z uh, walking through a development process on um, a platform and pretty painless, all things considered, right? Like there's, uh, like you said, if you, it's, it is predicated on you providing good documentation, right? Yes. Because it's not, it's not going to be cool to throw up guardrails, which are great, you know, and important, and then not uh, show people how to remediate those problems when they pop up. Um, yep. And it doesn't do you any good to shift left again, if you're not showing people how to fix that stuff. So, um, but with all that put together, this looks like it creates a pretty seamless um, way for developers to really just control control their own process when it comes to deploying their applications, which is great. Yeah. So question for you, this is a philosophical debate I've been having with um, some folks about this whole platform thing, because like on one end you have just pure Kubernetes, right? Mm -hmm. Like just, just plain raw Kubernetes, you've got the API. We've already talked about how that's not adequate, right? You're mm -hmm. missing right. some functionality. You also don't have like, you know, good security and all that stuff. Right. But then on the far end over here is what some large companies have done. Some are famous for it, um, which is create an entire abstraction layer that is you as a developer write code and do nothing else. Maybe write like, you know, one little file that's specific to your company, specific to your platform, mm -hmm. and then obfuscate everything in the middle. And then we have what I've shown here today, which I think is much more of a middle ground, right? There's guardrails in place that don't let you go over here. There's a lot of things in place, but you still have to write some Kubernetes YAML. You mm -hmm. might have to even write a Helm chart. <sighs> um, <laughs> but like, and I'm curious where you think, you know, the, the right place to land in that spectrum is. Um. I feel like, so my opinion is that landing farther to the, if we have the, like the big restrictive companies over here and we've got like the wild, wild west over here, I feel like going a little farther left of center uh, is is where I would fall, right? Because when you get over to the, the very far end of that uh, with the what big corporations sometimes do, um, it does create like a lot of friction um, and makes it a little more difficult uh, for developers to, to get, you know, there's having a hard time getting your work done because you have to take care of everything. And there's having a hard time getting your work done because you're hemmed in by mm. uh, some very, you know, strongly held opinions and restrictions. Um, I feel like those platforms um, and I, I tend to think of those more almost like a, as a platform as a service kind of thing versus a, a, a developer platform, right? Because it's here are the tools and things that you use and this is how you interact with the thing. But I feel like when we create these kinds of platforms, we're kind of building it around what the devs already use. So we're incorporating the tooling and we're already like, we're working around like the workflows that they're familiar with already and just adding some almost like some templates on top of it, really just, uh, mm -hmm. um, so I think that that, I think that's, that's better. Yeah. Um, you don't want to get too restrictive, you know, because that then just makes it, it introduces a whole different set of difficulties. It doesn't remove difficulties. You know what I mean? Agreed. Agreed. And also like, you know, there's, there's two arguments that people make, I think, for, you know, going the full blown abstraction layer. One is, you know, I don't think, developers should have to learn Kubernetes, which that's an interesting one because like if, and if somebody, one of our customers actually made this point recently, which is like, but if anybody out there is going to say like any developers, like I know our company uses Kubernetes. I want to get better at, you know, how we use, how we deploy our application. They go take a training course on Kubernetes. If you've built this whole abstraction layer, that doesn't do them any good. 
They don't mm-hmm. know, you know, where the, where the, the connecting right. lines are. And yeah. also that's a massive effort. It's just so much work to build something that is flexible enough and big enough to do that. And some companies have the resources to do that, but not a ton that I know. No. So I tend no. to agree with you completely. It's, you know, we, it's okay to have to learn a little bit of Kubernetes. Yes. Let's try and bring the floor up, make it easier so that, um, you know, there's a happy path to deploying and we can unlock all this other stuff later or, you know, open it up a little bit if there's more complex things that need to be done. And we're not so hemmed into our, to use your term, uh, into our process that we can't expand without, you know, months of development effort to fix our platform. So right. I think yeah. this is, this is the, this is the way. I, I agree. I agree. And I also think like, uh, you know, there's, I think there's benefit to having like a basic understanding of how the things that you are developing will run on the platform that you're running them on, right? I think it's it, there's some uh, importance to knowing how your application will run on Kubernetes, right? Because it's not the same way it's going to run on something else, right? So um, I think there's a benefit to that as well, because there are going to be some things you are going to want to change and alter in your application to make it run more smoothly. So mm. you can't hide from it. So you might as well like right. have a basic understanding of it. And yeah, but I also, but I do agree that like, it's not worth like having to learn a whole, like, like really deeply learn a whole other set of tools or concepts just to get your work done is an ideal either, right? Like that slows down the process. So exactly exactly so let's not hide it but not necessarily make it so you have to be a kubernetes expert to deploy right right Uh, but we don't need to hide the fact that we're running kubernetes under here and not expose you know some of the really great stuff that kubernetes gives us and all these other tools Mm -hmm. agreed agreed all right we talked about fairwinds insights playing talked about platforms but Lots of lots of good stuff in there. I think we only scratched the surface of all the different pieces of insights that you can use. Uh, very much focused on the platform today, but uh, you know, cost management, security, uh, all those great things built in, and you can tie them into your platform. Uh, and then, oh right, uh, there's a free tier of it. We we didn't talk about that. So insights, everything I did today was totally included in our free tier of insights. You can use it on up to two clusters. Uh, and so you can totally recreate all of the uh, the things I did today if you really want to uh, using insights um, on the free tier. So go check that out if you are interested. Uh, and then uh, all of our open source on our, our GitHub page, which is incorporated in insights as well. That's right. So, all right. Well, okay. Stevie, thank you for hosting and well, asking all the good questions. Mandy, thank you for hyping and doing all the good tech things. I try. And thank you everybody who showed up today to listen. We appreciate your time and we hope you all have a great rest of your week.